Mark here and welcome to Biodiversity Shorts. Now at my feet here, there is a column of army ants. Watch out Tasha, watch out. Whoa. Let's take a closer look. The name of this ant is Chylomyrmex megalonyx. Now, I may have the pronunciation wrong, but there's not a lot known about this species of ant. There are only five specimens of this ant documented in Antweb, and four of those specimens date back to the 1920s. I also found a Japanese website with some excellent photos of this same species, and he says that these are very hard to find and they live most of their time underground. This certainly matches up with my observations as I only see these ants in my garden maybe two or three times per year. Chylomyrmex will build coverings, well at least attempt to build coverings over its trails in order to protect itself from predators. Some species of army ants are known to be specialist hunters of other ant species and they will take over entire colonies of other ants. I have noticed on a few occasions that there is a steep reduction in the number of leafcutter ants in our garden after Chylomyrmex has been sighted. Now these ants aren't quite as big as you think. Let me show you exactly how big they are. Now they can actually sense my finger before I even get to them, which is quite amazing given that they are blind. Although he grabbed hold of me there, it didn't hurt at all because his sting is in his tail. But typically you would not encounter them just on your fingertip you would be uh, stepping on them in the wild. Let's test that out. So I'm going to attempt to hold my foot down here for as long as I can. Let's go. Ah ha ha, ah ow, 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 ow. The sting from these ants is much more intense than from a common honeybee, and it is right up there with Australia's biggest bull ants. Once stung, the pain is instantly at its maximum, and after a few minutes, it dies off a little bit, but remains very uncomfortable for at least an hour. The worst of the accidental stings that I received while filming caused my foot to involuntarily twitch for several minutes after I was stung. Being Australian, I'm pretty good with this sort of thing and I only experienced a small amount of swelling. However, I would not recommend anyone try this themselves because there is always the risk that you could go into anaphylactic shock and die. As well as being an excellent defence against larger predators, their sting has a paralysing effect on smaller prey. This dung beetle will be unable to get away from the ants. Once it is fully paralysed, it will be dismembered in order to feed the colony. Even the tiny tick nymph on the forehead of the beetle will be carried away to become food for the colony. In the evening, the ants become a lot more active. We can see here, if we lift this rock, that they are moving their entire colony. Their eggs, pupa and larvae are all being moved to another location. That location may be another ant nest or it may simply be a temporary bivouac where they link their bodies together on the outside in order to protect the important parts of the colony, the queen, the eggs and the larvae and pupae on the inside. So... <coughs> What we're going to do here is we're going to collect some of these army ants and they're really, really active at night. They are absolutely everywhere. Now, I have to be careful here because the more I stir them up, the more active they get. And there's just more and more of them moving about this area. 
all the time. So I'll be as quick as I can. It's amazing, they stick to each other like Velcro. This is fascinating. One ant is supporting the weight of 20 or even 50 below it, and I can actually feel them pulling on the stick as I pull upwards because the others are connected to the grass below still. Look at that. There we go. Ow, ow, ow. Yep, I probably should have had a longer stick here. Okay, I think I've got enough. Let's go and do a little experiment with these guys. I originally thought that these were fire ants, and fire ants have a well-known behaviour of being able to link themselves together so that they float on water. I wanted to see this for myself. Right, so what we'll do, we've got our ants in here, I'm going to shake them up a bit, and we're going to see if they float. Oh, look at that. Now it's not too surprising that they float quite well, but even the individuals can float on their own and move about on the surface of the water. Now this is not only because they are very small, but they are also covered in lots of tiny hairs as well. In order to see this, we're going to need some more powerful macro equipment and even a microscope. Most of these girls paddled away to safety, but I saved a few and even sacrificed a couple in order to get a much closer look. Let's go. You can clearly see the hairs on the ant's head and jaws here. Now one thing is, you might think, how does the ant eat with the jaws a size like that? Like, it can bite my finger for instance, but how does it actually eat? And I was lucky enough to capture this. Look at that, those little mouth parts are mostly hidden away. Now in order to see these mouth parts, I'm going to slow the footage down just a little bit. It looks like something straight out of the movie Alien. Now one thing I wanted to find out was if this ant had any evidence of eyes. And yes, it did look like there were two lighter patches either side of the ant's head. Now, I don't know how well these would function, maybe they only see the difference between light and dark, but it does show that this ant has been living underground for a very long time. You can see some hairs there just in front of its mouth parts, it might help to help it sense when there's prey or food objects really close to it. Moving to the abdomen now, you can see that the entire body is covered in very small hairs. This is the thorax, again small hairs on the thorax and on all the legs as well. This is the sting and it is quite long, long enough just to get under the surface of my skin anyway, straight to the nerves. Now under the microscope, a really close look at the sting, you can see that it looks like it's hollow and it's got, there's a little bit of leftover venom there on the outside of it. This is the base of one of the ant's antenna, and you can see as you go further and further along the antenna, the hairs get more numerous and finer and finer. These fine hairs help the ant to sense vibrations in the air, so in effect it can hear with its feelers. The feelers can also detect chemicals in the air, so it can smell as well with these multi-purpose organs. Much like ourselves and other mammals, the hairs on the ant's body probably also help with the sense of touch as well. This is one of the ant's foreclaws. It's very sharp and relatively long. And this is one of the midclaws. They're a bit shorter, not quite as sharp. Now previously we saw this display of amazing strength from these ants. And if we take the claws and we superimpose another image, you can see that they just about 
interlock perfectly to enable that strong monkey-like grip between the two ants. Finally, I noticed this interesting feature on the inside of some of the ant's legs, and it looks to me to be a very tiny hairbrush, and obviously being covered in small hairs, the ants need to keep themselves clean. So perhaps ants will be able to provide the next breakthrough in hair care technology. My name is Mark Griffith, thank you for watching. If you've enjoyed this content, please head over to biodiversityshorts.com, I have more videos there, and I also have a YouTube channel which you can subscribe to. That way you will know when I release my next video. I also have a section on my website to do with advanced photography if you're interested in some of the techniques that I use to film this series. Anyway, I will catch you next time. Cheers. Here's the same shot slowed down to 25% of the original speed.